It's a real privilege to be here with you. And I mean that seriously. You're going to be doing something quite different this morning. See that little pile there? That's for you. Partway through the message, just so that it doesn't shock you when it happens, I'm warning you now. We're going to go through a little exercise. And as we begin this this morning, I just want us to think about the fact that sometimes we don't get things in really healthy perspective. Sometimes life gets a little bit messy. And I want to ask you a question. Are there days when you feel that your life has gotten out of balance at times? Are the things that you're doing actually pushing you between work, the children, the house, the warrant for your car? And I say that because we got back from overseas and both our warrants were due the week we got back and for the first time ever, both cars failed a warrant. Or things people want you to do. See, time often gets lost. But none of us are alone on this. I I think, you know, we, we equate the kind of stresses and pressures in such a way that we say, well, you know, all this stuff's happening. If I just stop doing things, then it'll help. And it actually doesn't help at all. In fact, for me, that would be the biggest disaster in my life because I'm not healthy when I stopped doing things. When I was younger, that was my way sometimes of, of dealing with stuff was just to stop doing things. Pressure and conflict at work, at home, or whatever. It means that sometimes you feel a lack of control over what's happening in your life. But I want to say this morning that none of us need to feel this. It is an, an innate need to control things in our lives that means that we actually do things that are not helpful to what we're meant to be and what we're meant to be able to do to keep balance. Most of us would like to have a better balance than we have. And even some of us here in the room are saying, well, my life's balanced, but any of us looking from the outside might actually observe something quite different. Because I know people, and I've known people over the years, who really have felt they've got great balance, but you only need to look around the weight behind them to realize that in actual fact, other people's boats are tipping over because of what they've done. I always remember my father telling me the story. You may remember when the big cat was traveling from Porirua here over to Picton, Catamaran. It was quite a fast boat. <clears throat> and when it entered the Marlborough Sounds, it used to create this massive wake. And my father, who has always been on the sea and on the water, since he was quite young, found himself in my brother's boat, and he was top siding for my brother. While my brother dived, Dad was on the top, and there's a safety thing you do if you go diving. So Dad was top siding for my brother, and this ferry came in screaming speed. The harbour board actually made them reduce to 15 kilometres an hour after a few of these instances because this boat that wasn't a small boat that Dad was in almost flipped. And my father talked about afterwards of being quite scared because it was such a big wake. There were boats that were damaged on, as that boat went in and out at different times. There were wharves that were damaged and beach that was damaged. And some of us are catamarans. And while you're traveling on the catamaran, it can feel good but we don't always realize the damage we're doing. In the long term, not only to others, but to ourselves. So when we talk about this this morning, I want us to really reflect quite a lot on who we are. See, healthy balance actually is affected by decisions. And the decisions we make are the difference between healthy or unhealthy balance. 
some of the things that show in the balance of life here, these blocks, you know, <clears throat> some of the things like people, people pressure. Stuff that we do. Family, sometimes. Work. And we, we, we try to balance these things off, but the problem is, and this is what actually happens quite often, we get things out of kilt, and so we end up with these big things. And we end up with all sorts of messy stuff that just tips the balance. We end up in situations where, where messes that we make tip the balance of life, and we, we don't have a really good balance. And so, so I want to suggest that we need to think about this whole balance thing. Often our decisions are what I would call reactive. Reactive decisions are based on four things. The first one is in our belief systems. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Secondly, in previous modeling, like a parenting that our parents had or, or people that were, we were close to who were older than us often, sometimes younger. Being over or underconfident, having an overconfidence or a lack of confidence, in other words. Or based on not, uh, when we are not well Processed. I didn't word that very well considering the first part. So reactive decisions are not well processed decisions. They're things that we, we do without working through things easily. One of the interesting things that happened to us when we were away overseas is that John Kaiser, one of the consultants I went to meet with, he spent some time with us and then disappeared. He left us in his holiday home and he said, when you get back to Chattanooga, I'd like to process some more with you. I'd like to do a debrief type processing. And um, I said, oh, yeah, that sounds interesting. He says, look, you need to understand, I'm a serious process person. It takes me time afterwards before I get really clear on things. And so I see, he said to me, it will probably be the most helpful thing for you if we follow what I'm suggesting. And I says, whatever, John, if this is going to be the best. I, I've got to tell you, Pauline will tell you, he and I were sitting on the porch looking over the Appalachian Mountains and uh, looking at everything around us and, and having these deep conversations about church life and what God wants to do and the kinds of things you've got to look at and watch out for and all the rest of it. When we got back to Chattanooga, we ended up sitting down uh, over a meal together, the three of us, and Pauline was with us, and we end up doing some debris stuff in that. I came away from that afterwards and thought the value that happened there that hadn't happened on that first meeting would never have happened if we hadn't a process, uh, given John a chance to process. It was really high value. I was amazed how high it went. I was not sure whether it was going to change a lot, but it did. So let's go back at the beginning. The belief systems. Some of us have belief systems that are really faulty. Even those people that claim to be really alive Christians and they love to worship Jesus and all the rest of it, our belief systems can still be faulty because we can often find ourselves saying, I could never do that. Or on the other extreme, I could be a worship leader. Or I could do that or I could do this or I could... Whatever. Trouble is, if you can't sing in tune, you can't really be a worship leader. And I would suggest that some of the things that we do in life actually are not in tune with who we are. So I, I think that complicates it because our belief systems can actually undermine us. We can believe that we are actually people who, who, um, who can have uh, the Bible and mix things from the world with it. I was surprised some years ago when I saw, saw some statistics that, from research that had been done about people who claimed to be Christians who still took a peek at the stars in the newspaper. 
That's a faulty belief system. You either believe God or you don't believe God. And as soon as you're peeking at stars, let me say this really clearly, or you're doing other things of similar nature, you don't believe God. You may go to church every week, but you don't believe God. Or other faulty belief systems that says things like, like, uh, you know, I, I know what I want in life and I know what's healthy for me and best for me in life. Another friend of mine said to me, he said, uh, you know, my life, my, my life got in a mess. My wife, um, in the end, left me because of stuff I did and it was awful. And he said, I found this other woman and she did everything I wanted to do. She loved to play golf. She loved to be out in sports. She loved to go walking in the bush, she said, which my wife didn't like doing. He said, so I married her, only to discover she never liked doing all the other things that I appreciated about my wife. He said, I suddenly realized I had this person who was doing everything with me and doing nothing for me. And he said, I'd had a very loving wife who'd been very caring, had been supportive, had been with me and and, and supportive all those years, and I'd never appreciated it. You see, his belief system was that he was better than he really was. He was something, deserved something better. But in actual fact, he didn't even know what was better for him. So it's those kinds of things. Previous modeling. This one here is quite complex sometimes because people do, are not even aware of the things. The obvious things, like my father who tried to convince us we shouldn't swear in the house. But he used to say, don't you bleep, 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 swear in this bleep, bleep house. Right? What was he modeling? What he was saying and what he was modeling were two different things. They were opposites. You know, th those kind of things in life. You know, uh, when, when parents do things that are not helpful to their children, their children actually, even if, they, if you tell them, don't do what I did, they will still do it. When Paulie and I got married, I determined I was never going to react like my father used to react. I was never going to do it. I was so opposed to my father's behavior that I was never going to do it. And you know the strangest thing was? I actually did it and felt so bad and so regretted so badly what I'd done. So modeling in our life actually tends to mean that we live unhealthy lives. We don't have good health-life balance. You see, if we just do what comes naturally... We will be blown around like dust in the wind, doing whatever uh, <clears throat> way the wind takes us, and feeling unfulfilled, empty, and even frustrated. That's what will happen. And I know plenty of people who claim to be Christians who have the same thing. There's some reasons why that happens, and we're going to cover that this morning. That is not good or balanced. It's pretty obvious. But sometimes you need to state it for it to be obvious. Bad decisions are part of having an unbalanced life. You see, bad decisions lead to disappointment, pain, and inner turmoil. That's what actually happens. But we keep doing the same dumb things. How many people here in this room have never done the same dumb thing? Hmm? I think we've all done dumb things. Bad decisions. And bad decisions equal destructive behavior, dysfunctional relationships, poor work habits, and deep yearning for something better. And let me say this really clearly to you. Poor work habits doesn't mean to say you're not working well. It doesn't mean to say you're not working, uh, uh, doing your company well. But your work habits may be being destructive to your family, may be being destructive to yourself because you're just overdoing it. You're not doing well. In the long term, it won't benefit the company you're working for in any case. Because what you model is what others will follow, will copy. Good decisions, on the other hand, lead to balance, which equals a contented, enjoyable, and, and fulfilled lives. That's what it actually equals. If you have balance in life, all the aspects in your life will actually be there. Now, I want to ask you a question. When you look at this circle on the, on the corner there, you know, look at the things that are on that, on that circle. The social, 
the physical, the material, the professional, the emotional, the pleasurable, the spiritual, and the mental things. Are they in balance in your life? Are they actually in balance in your life? See, healthy, proactive decisions are based on best values. So those things that might be out of balance, they can actually be changed. And we don't need to accept the default settings that we often have in ourselves. See, when we look at it, we can look at the kinds of things, and this is another way of looking, of viewing that whole deal. We can look at all those things and know that we can get balance. It's spoken of Jesus, that little passage in the middle here. It says, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. We're meant to be following him if we're followers of Jesus. If you're not yet, it's great to have you here. But this is, this is what really makes life fulfilling. If we actually really are intentional about these things. Now, I, I'm saying intentional because it's actually about choices that we make. It really is about choices. Some people have said to me, you know, especially people who don't know me well, well, Gary, you don't know what it's like. You know, you, you've always been in the church. Well, for one, I haven't always been in the church. I come from a very anti-Christian background. For two, I had to make decisions to be who I am today. Even if you're in the church, doesn't mean to say you're going to make good decisions. That's what God wants us to do. But that's the way it is. You know, some people say, you know, I, I'm not going to come to church because I know such and such, and they'll name some Christian. And look at their life and all the rest of it. And I say, well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. put the brakes on a wee, for a wee moment. When I first came to church, I wasn't very nice or very good either. It's taken a long time for me to change. And I'm still doing it. My wife and myself, we... We now have very little conflict, but that wasn't what it was like at the beginning of our journey, I can assure you. We had to make decisions. We had to go through processes. So, <clears throat> I have a little chart here. And in a moment, I'm going to get some people to hand one out to you each. And we're going to take a couple of minutes doing a little exercise It covers these areas of your life, relationships, your work, your career, your family, your financial responsibility, your self-care, health, and church and spiritual growth. Involved in that, we're going to look at it in terms of the core values that you have, because these core values will affect what happens in these different areas of your life. Now, for some of you, you may not be yet followers of Jesus. Some of you may be very new followers of Jesus. So your core values might be quite small in terms of the size that you understand. They actually might be larger than you think, but, but some of you might say, well, I don't know what my core values are. And your core values are spelt out by the reactions and things that you do in any given situation. So in an extreme pressure situation, the things that you do there are caused by the things that you value, the things that you have as your primary ways of thinking in the background. If you do well in some situations, that'll be because of the core values you have. So there's a whole range of stuff. So in terms of this, your core values will determine the balance or imbalance in your life. So can I have, say, five or six people come out? I'm going to give you one of these each. Oh, sorry. And if anybody hasn't got a pen, um, I don't know whether we've got enough, but we'll, we'll, we'll try. Um, just take the whole bag out with you, bunny, because you can't, you can't open, carry it in the box. It just goes everywhere. Some of the pens are not as good as others, but that's all we had. So, so if you want a pen, put your hand up, and Pauline will come with a pen. And what I want you to do with this, once you've got the stuff is I want you to colour in a score for yourself. 
So you can see the first ring has 0 to 3, the second ring has 4 to 7, and the third ring has 8 to 10. And if you think you're a 1 in an area, just color in a little piece of it. Divide that into, into four pieces, okay? That's 0, 1, 2, 3. Color it in. And if you're right out to 10 and you think you're icing it on here, when you've colored it in, after you've colored it in, I'm going to get you to share it with somebody who knows you well next to you. And uh, if you don't have anybody that knows you well, just to have an assessment yourself on it. And you, you'll be able to work out what shape you are. So some areas are going to have a one on them. Some of them might have a zero. Some of them might have a seven. Some of them might have a three, whatever it is. Just fill in, color in uh, each, each section according to whether it's a, a naught to a three, a four to a seven, or eight to ten. Uh, color in each piece, but not the whole piece, because if you're coloring the whole piece, it's going to mean you're a 10. You might only be an 8. Okay? So if you do that, give you a couple of minutes to do it. Work it out. Has everybody got one? Anybody missing them? I'm not giving you a lot of time. You have to be quick with it. If you think too much, you're probably trying to make yourself look better than you really are. So just do each section one at a time. And you don't have to colour the whole thing and just put a line out to where it goes if you want to. I mean, if you're anything like me, I'm not very good at colouring in. Anybody got a question about that? Feel free to ask. There might be other people thinking the same thing. Yeah. It's who you are now. No, no, it's, no, no, just, just, uh, no. Because most of us are idealists, and so we need to be r practical realists. Yeah. So is the number from zero to ten, is that how well balanced it is? Yeah, the be the, a ten is when you're well, really well balanced. A zero is you're not balanced at all. Sorry, that's a good question. I didn't... Thank you, Rob. I should have said that. The higher the score, the better the balance you've got in your life on that issue. <clears throat> so you should have done at least three now. Just do it quickly. Work, career, it means, if you've got balance in work or career, it means that you are not obsessed with work. Or the other extreme, you're not obsessed with not wanting to work. Your relationships with anybody except your family, because your family's a separate one on there. Thank you. The, the, the relationship's based around the fact that every human being, God designed us to be in community. So if we're not in community, we're not in good relationships, then you're in a bad place. You'd give yourself a one or a zero. <laughs>
financial responsibility. Are you being responsible with the money that you have? That includes tithing. So if you're not giving to God, then you'd put yourself a way lower mark. Just before somebody gets to it, self-care, health. Are you, are you actually making sure you're looking after yourself? Are you keeping healthy? Are you, are you keeping warm when you need to? Are you, um, are you being wise about your own health care? Uh, and, and, and I'd suggest things like, do you, wash your t- do you clean your teeth? Have a wash regularly enough for your own sake? Because that one there will affect that one there. I got got one minute to finish off. Ten seconds. Don't worry if you haven't finished. You can finish it off after the service. Okay, can everybody stop and stop looking at their chart just for a moment? Temptation is to keep looking if you haven't finished. Just, just don't. don't. Don't do that, okay? Okay. I'm going to call this the wheel of a balanced life. Are you, going, are you going to go bouncing down the road because your wheel's so odd shaped? Or is it nice and rounded? Is it a square wheel? Because square wheels don't get you very far. We all know that thump, 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 you know? Now, I don't want to leave you in despair here. It'd be very easy just to walk off now and say, well, that's you lot. But I want to suggest that Jesus actually gives four models, four ways of, that he modeled for us so that we live a healthier life. The first one is he looked to God, not to others, to determine his priorities. And so therefore we need to look to God, not to others, to determine our priorities. And, and we see it like this. Jesus established his priorities by st- spending time where, where? With the Father. We see it in a the, in the scripture in Mark chapter 1. We see this thing here. Jesus uh, got up and he left the house and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. Simon and his companions searched for him. They found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. Let us go, he said to them, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. Now this is important to get this. Um, Sorry. Because what actually happened here 
as Jesus was making it very clear that the God thing was his priority, what he was here to do was his priority, not the pressures and demands of the people around him right there and then. And I, I, I need to say this. I've gone through oscillating points in my life as a pastor where I get all compassionate for people and then I put pressure on myself to do the things that need to be done that God's called me to do. And I, I, I've gotten better at it, but, but it messes with your head. It messes with your ability to function. It means you end up doing crazy, crazy hours at night working and things like that. When there's imbalance, that's what happens. And so Jesus was spending time with the Father as the priority, not being pressured by other people. Let's have a look at the second one. The second part of this one, sorry. How could Jesus walk away from needs that only he could meet? Because he was doing all this healing. Nobody else was doing it at that point, right in the beginning of the book of Mark. How could he walk away from doing these things? Because I've often had Christians say, oh, but the, the, there's a need out there. There's this and there's that. But, but in actual fact, ask this question. If you're spending an hour trying to meet people's needs, are you spending an hour meeting with the Father first? And I would say if you're not, you shouldn't be trying to meet other people's needs. You, can't, you can give out the generosity of your spirit and your heart and your life, but unless it's connected with the Father's purpose and his direction and his power, it's actually a pointless exercise. Because the Father had different priorities for Jesus than simply a healing ministry, the healing balanced the teaching. So Jesus always kept these things in balance. You notice there's huge crowds around. Yes, he fed, fed them on a couple of occasions, but not all the time. Huge crowds around with lots of people who are sick, and he decides to give some teaching. Now, I think some of you in this room would probably decide to try and fix the people first. To put it in terms that some of the more academic brothers and sisters in here have, your theology, the teaching of truth, is just as important as ministry to people's needs. The two things must be in balance. And when imbalance happens, then incorrect theology, in fact, heresy develops. So some Christian organizations in the world that I'm not going to name, but I could name, I'm not going to do so, who have gotten so out of balance in terms of where to go. One of, one of those organizations, I have a very close friend, a very, very close friend, who's one of the leaders of the organization, and they have come to realization they are in trouble. But they can't undo it because they've got so tied up with all sorts of things. And they're just not seeing a way through. And they, they, they are frustrated as anything. So the balance has got to be there. Jesus determined instead to please the Father, not people. Some of you have... Pro old Rosella ends up with a short straw sometimes. Because some of you have come in and says, oh, can I talk to Gary? No, he's not available at the moment. I can hear from my office, by the way. Oh, but he's in the office. And Sella's saying, yeah, but he's not available right now. And some people, we, we had a discussion a while ago as to whether we should put a door or a gate in the office by Sellers Singh, so that people could not just walk into my office. Sometimes it, it really, you know, and, and I feel really awkward because I find it really hard to say no sometimes. But some of you know more recently in the last year that I've been saying more, no more often. Because we've got to be willing to do the things that are going to honor God first. And sometimes just meeting people's needs isn't the right thing. And Jesus showed that. 
And for those that are compassionate to people's needs, we have got to discipline ourselves. And those that couldn't give a stuff for people's needs, you need to go the other way. You've got to discipline yourself and make yourself available. Because you know why? If, if, if everybody responded in the right way that God is, is calling you to, there'd be nobody turning up my office trying to harass me. Because we'd all be sharing the load much more effectively. Because if we're trying to fix things ourselves, and we're trying not to fix things ourselves, that's because we are not really connecting with God's power in the process. I think it's important to understand. So therefore, we end up with imbalance in our life. As a consequence, Jesus was misunderstood, rejected, and even crucified at the end of the day. And you you can expect the same thing. I don't think they'll crucify you nowadays, so you're a wee bit fortunate on that. But getting your balance of priorities right in terms of how how much you connect with the Father, this is a core value. And the stronger that is, the better balance will happen in the other things. Okay. This was the reason for his success. So what does that actually mean for you and I? What would change on our chart, on our wheel of life, if we acted in the way that Jesus would have us do so. So it's not all about teaching, and it's not all about ministry. It's about a balance. Amen? Secondly, Jesus modeled by saying, he said, say, say, say no so that you can say yes. He, he modeled the say no so that you can say yes. And how did that work out? Well, Jesus said no, so that he could say yes to what was most important. The next one. Don't fall fall for the lie that a good person should never say no to legitimate needs. That is deception. In fact, in Jesus' terminology... He actually avoided some people at points because it it was a healthier life balance. Then, you know, if if, if there's somebody without food, by all means, give them some food. But be careful about what you're doing because missionaries in the old days created a problem and, and it's been publicly known What hasn't been so publicly known is that churches have done the same dumb thing. Food banks that support people's drug habits and alcohol because they get given food and so it gives them more money to spend on the wrong things is not the right process. That's not good balance. And we need to stop trying to make ourselves feel better by giving to people who don't actually deserve it. Now, that sounds cruel and it sounds hard, But if you do that kind of thing, then all you're doing is teaching them nothing except that I can get what I want. Now, that will not be popular amongst some Christians. But if we're going to have healthy life balance like Jesus did, we need to be prepared to say no so that we can focus on what's really important and and it'll, in the long term, benefit those other people. In the long term. This will allow you to make confident decisions amidst overwhelming demands. That's what it does. Now, for some of you have no demands because on the, on the spectrum of the, of the circle, you've given yourself a naught or a one for relationships <laughs> or even family. So, so it doesn't seem to actually make much difference to you. Well, it can in the long term. We can choose many good things and end up missing the best, the essential priorities that God intended us to have in our lives. I think this is why much of the Christian church has been quite powerless, because they're doing without being. And being in the presence of God and being one with God is the only way in which we can do what God has called us to do. And that's a, that's a pretty deep thing. Thirdly, things were never about himself. 
things were never about himself. In Ephesians 5, Paul picks it up on this. He said, follow God's example. See, notice it's God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. It's about walking in the way of love. And tonight, I, something is going to happen in the service tonight. I think it's going to have some impact on us in terms of what this actually means at a higher level. See, really, walking in the way of love doesn't mean I just give and give and give. It means I make a difference by how I live, by how I give. Okay. Fourthly, keep focused on what is really important. In Luke 9, 51, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Now, this is a model because he made some resolution to achieve what he knew God had before him. And balance in life doesn't mean I just do my own thing. Balance in life means I'm going to be resolved to do what is best. I've had to go through a process in my own life where God's wired me up so I'm gifted with my hands. And I have all these crazy ideas I could spend my whole life just doing those things, but I have had to make a decision that, no, that's not going to happen because the thing that God's really called me to is the thing I need to focus on, no matter what it is. You might be somebody who serves in the church some way. You might be somebody who, who dances in the church. You might be somebody who sings in the church. And every now and again, just for the singing one, Every now and again, I get the worship leaders will say to me, oh, I get so frustrated sometimes. Now, why is that? And I say to them, they say, because we turn up for practice and, and I gave the songs out. I gave people the ability to download them and to practice them before they came and they didn't know the words when they arrived. It's quite clear they're not practicing. See, if you're feeling called to something, you've got to be doing that thing. You can't afford to mess everybody else around because you've gotten yourself out of balance in other areas of your life. If you're working way too many hours, if you're, if you're too self-possessed, you're so self-possessed that you don't have any friends, then you need to work on those things. Jesus was a relational person who actually came to us and he caused people who were lonely people to face up the issues. Levi was a tax collector. When Jesus approached him, he wasn't popular in society. Tax collectors, when were they? Money used to be one many years ago. We used to have him on about being a tax collector. It was the Bibles. You know, there on and and you know the interesting thing is that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law lost perspective because when Levi became a follower of Jesus, one of the things he did is threw a party for all the guys he'd been tax collecting with and some sort of people of disrepute. And all the Pharisees and scribes could do was criticize what, that, what, what Jesus was doing when in actual fact, uh, what Levi was doing, sorry, when in actual fact, what Levi was doing was the very right thing to do. And sometimes we can, we can become a little critical of somebody else or we can try and copy somebody else, and that's just as bad. Just because they do it, should we do it also? I'd say no. What is the thing, for the, if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, the question I want to ask you here right now, what is the thing that you could do most powerfully with the time you've got right now that will benefit the kingdom of God and in the process also benefit you in a healthy way? And sometimes, you know, the people who live around us, they need more contact than anybody else from those of us that know Jesus. Balance in life isn't about trying to do everything. It's about being. So keep focused on what is really important. And focus means 
that you have to make decisions to say some things I will not do. There's one or two people in our congregation here who really are good at getting focus. Some probably go too far on the focus because you've got to keep the balance. But, but, but keeping focus on what is important in all sorts of areas in your life is actually really a valuable thing to do. Jesus modeled it so well. Full balance happens when we understand that you have, you understand that you have the seeds of God's DNA in you. And that, that has some implications. You see, the fact of the matter is, that means you've got greatness on the inside, even though you've never understood it. And you may not feel like it. You, oh, yeah, but you don't understand my life. And all the rest of it. Well, God picked me up and he changed me, and there's plenty of people like me, and some even better than me, way, way better, you know, who... who, who, who <coughs> who've had God unlock their insides and greatness has burst out of them. Sometimes people say, oh, I wish I was like such and such. Actually, it's no good wishing. It's deciding. Wishing doesn't do anything. That's about as pointless as chucking coins into water in a well and saying, I hope this happens. I wish this happens. Mm -hmm. Now, great things wishing wells when I was a kid. There's one in Picton, and um, there were some kids who lived in Picton. There was a wishing well. Do you, how many people have seen the wishing well in Picton on the foreshore? It used, used to be there. I'm not sure it's still there, actually. It is still there, is it? Okay. So the wishing well was there, and people would chuck money in it, but some really astute kids in Picton had figured out how to nick it. And it, it nicked the money out of the well. And, and, and you know the funny thing about it is, the funny thing about it is, that we often have wishes, but they're stolen before they can become real because we're not resolute about chasing them. Chucking money in water in a well and hoping something's going to happen, about as stupid as running into a brick wall with your head to try and make sense of yourself. You know? Just doesn't do anything. But if we understand that we've already got God's DNA in us and that we, Jesus has been a really good model for us in terms of getting uh, balance in life. You know, one of the interesting things about Jesus with balance of life, his mother and his brothers turned up once saying, oh, Jesus is out of control. You guys have got to control him. You, got to, you know, he's doing all the stuff. And uh, calm down. And Jesus' response wasn't to say, oh, okay, mum, you know, calm down. He didn't say that. He just sort of said to the crowd when he got told that they were at the back of the crowd saying this, who are my mother and brothers and sisters? Those who do the will of God. Mm hmm? Yeah. The reality is you have ability beyond your knowledge that you have on the inside. And so, therefore, there's a lot of hope that you can get more balance. Now, later date, I, I want to I deal with some of the other issues around smaller things around the balance. This is an overarching thing here to, this morning. You are God's what? Every single one of you is. And if you don't feel like you are, then you, then you need to accept the fact that you're not believing what the Bible says. If you're not accepting what the Bible says, you'll never amount to anything of value. Because you have got to accept God's word to be able to have the full potential released in you that he intended. He, he made you. He designed you. He knows what he wanted from you. For we are God's workmanship created. How'd that happen? Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's the reality. Now, so one of the things I'd like you to do with your wheel, I'd like you to take your wheel away and say, and pray over your wheel. And if you don't know Jesus yet, then ask him to help you. Because there's a really good way of getting to know him. You'll see the difference he can make. And pray over your wheel and say, God, how can I change this? 
And if you're lacking in some area, if you've got a zero or one or a two or a three, that's a lack, by the way. If you're lacking in some area, then what you want to do, and it's really not a hard thing to do nowadays, is get on the, on, onto your Bible and do some searches and think of words around the thing that you need to work on. So in terms of relationships, you can get on... There's some really good Christian stuff on the internet. You type in relationships Christian. Don't type in just relationships. You get all sorts of hoody doody stuff. You see, decisions actually surround us every day. And the way to get balance is to assess everything you face, not just re react, not just respond. Be proactive in your thinking, in your decision-making, and the things that you actually do with God. Don't get over overwhelmed with all that sort of stuff. And here's, here's the three things you can do with that chart. The first thing is, ask yourself, what is not working? The second thing you want to do is determine how it got that way. And it might be because of DNA stuff in your family or whatever, and so you might need to get some help around that. So then you work on how to fix it. And if you're not sure, talk to your um, impact group leader. And if you're not an impact group, get into one, because that's how you're going to get the help. Don't come knocking on my door saying, help me, fix me, because I want our, group, our leaders to actually learn how to, how to do this process stuff. If it keeps happening with me all the time, it's not going to be helpful in the long term. So what are the core things that you're missing in, 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 terms of your, in terms of your picture? I'm just going to dive back to that. What are the core things that actually, that you, that w where things are not good for you? Should have put one at the end. So what are the core things that are missing? Because usually you will find that when there's a weakness in one particular area, that what actually is happening, there's a weakness in your core values somewhere. And so understanding what, what core values you need to look at to reassess who you are and how you function is actually really important. Are there any questions as we finish this morning? Sorry? Um, that, 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 that wheel is, is um, something that really applies to all humans, really, in one sense, but, yeah. So, sorry? For us. Yeah, this is, this is for us. The, 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 the thing is, some people will have core values, who are not in the church, they have core values that cause the functioning of these things outside, and often you'll find, and I, I could say this about myself before I became a Christian, there were a couple of areas I was really, really strong in, but the other areas were total deficit. And I think when we get that balance with the core values that God created us for, then we don't end up with bumpy wheels. We get much more rounded as people. And, and um, some secular people use a mechanism a little bit similar to this. It's not quite the same. Um, that, that, but, but the core values thing is the thing that they don't seem to get the head around. Their core values are, are based around ambitions and desires. So, for example, uh, some people belong to an organization where they believe that putting a red Ferrari on the front of their dash of their car is going to help them get one long term because they can see it as a vision. I think that's selfish. I don't think it's driven by healthy core values. It's, it's driven by heavy amounts of selfishness. And, and so it's not good for them in the long term. It might make them feel good temporarily, but as soon as they get the red Ferrari, what's going to be the next thing? I mean, they're going to, they're going to end up putting a, a castle on the front dash and they won't be able to see the other car they run into. You know? Yeah, so, yeah. And he goes, your nice red Ferrari. So they lost everything again. So, so... Yeah, any other questions? Thank you, Fiona.
Now, in terms of, in terms of this, just to finish off, these areas are all covered in Scripture. I would suggest, if you want to get your head around this a lot more, focus on the New Testament a lot. But be careful, and this is one of the things I think the enemy's been working overtime on. When there's something that addresses an issue, don't come away feeling beat up by it and discouraged, because that's what the enemy will do. When you read the Word of God, he will try and twist it so you beat up on yourself. The reason for reading Scripture is so you might see the thing and put some focus on bringing the change. Don't, don't, don't let your initial response, oh my goodness, that's me. I feel terrible and I, I'm no good. That, that's not the response to Scripture. The response to Scripture should be, oh wow, that's a revelation for me. That's something that I'm not yet, but I know that you want me to be God. And so I want to be what I see in Scripture. I, I want to be like that. Because the heroes of faith in Scripture aren't perfect people. If you look through Hebrews 11 and see the list, there's a bunch of very imperfect people there, but are considered heroes in God's eyes because they were willing to face some issues and willing to change. Even when they did, some of them did the worst things possible. I mean, somebody got up and shared last week in my group that, I think it was my impact group, I can't remember who it was now, um, that David was a hero. But David committed adultery. David arranged to have somebody murdered because he committed adultery. But at the end of the day, he actually decided he needed to repent. Yeah, God, God sent Samuel, but God always sends somebody to get in our ear. We can make a choice, either get angry about that or realize that we've got to get our core values right because as soon as we get angry about somebody coming with something God gives us, we actually skew this whole thing. And God wants us to realize that what we, what we need to do as individuals is say, okay, God, I'm willing to be a learner and when I see something, I'm not going to let that bomb me or discourage me. I'm going to let that change me. And when I start to to believe the scripture is when I, when I really start to believe the scripture, not just intellectually, is when I actually do things to change who I am because of what scripture says. We're all weevil, we're all wicked, we all know that, we don't need to be reminded too often. There's one or two people in, in the church that need reminding because they think they're all good and all perfect. But that's another expression of wickedness. We just need to actually really understand that getting our head around what God is saying and getting balance in these areas is actually really important because it's a kingdom thing that God put us here to do well and to bless others. But most of all, more than anything else, to bless him in the way that we live. Amen? Let's pray. God, sometimes we have just gotten concerned about getting balance in life by trying to do things rather than be like you. Sometimes we are impatient and don't realize that our impatience comes from something in the past. We get angry or we get frustrated with people or we have ideas about what we think they should be like instead of hearing what you think they should be like. We damage relationships by attitudes we have, by things we think, by things we say. Sometimes some of us are way too lazy and don't work for the money that we're getting. And some of us are way too busy and working too hard for the health of our families and the health of your kingdom. Lord, there's some of us that need to think about our own self-care 
Father, sometimes we have been obsessed with just giving too much to ones that are too young. We haven't taught financial responsibility by the way we've lived sometimes. And Lord, finally and mostly, we know that if we spiritually grow that it's going to change how we function in all those other areas. So God, we want to confess this morning that we haven't sometimes spent enough time with you like Jesus did. Sometimes we've just been too busy doing instead of growing and growing spiritually. Sometimes we think we're better than other people. One or two of us here, Lord, have, have felt that maybe Impact Group doesn't have anything to offer me, but that's actually a pride issue, Father, and we want to confess that. Because God... Wherever we go, we have something to offer and others have something to offer to us. And your word makes it so clear. So help us to be learners who are disciples, real disciples. Because that way this world is going to change. So Lord, give us your wisdom. Give us your insight. Give us your understanding. And help us to be people who are going to make steps to follow through. They're not just going to wish, but going to do what you did, be totally intentional, and therefore enjoy life even more than we've ever had. So we look to you in Jesus' name. And they all said...